All right, it's going to be a great interview tonight. Bob Collymore, CEO of Safaricom, first time back after nine months. Let's cut, get a couple of things out of the way. Number one, revenue last year for Safaricom, 200 billion shillings. Profit, 55 billion shillings. If Safaricom was to sell this company to someone today, it would be worth 10 billion US. No wonder they paid my guest today 196 million shillings last year. Good Lord. We'll get to that in a moment. 196. Let me just internalize it. Bob, welcome back. You know what I'm finding funny? What? The fact that you're looking at a blank screen. <laughs> there is actually nothing. And I'm reading statistics, on that right? Screen. <laughs> Isn't that cool, though? Isn't that cool? Welcome back, man. Thank you. I mean, we were, we were uh, many of us, your friends and everyone out there, we were very worried. And um, obviously, you discovered you had cancer, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Take it from there. How, how did you discover? I mean, you don't wake up one day and say, geez, I think I have cancer. No, I think um, I had been feeling unwell for a while. Uh, you know, <laughs> Caprona Catoni came to see me when I was in London. And he says, we just thought you were getting boring. <laughs> I said, Kip, it's because, you know, you're skipping, you know, functions in the evening yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was feeling tired. Um, I was running temperatures from time to time. But the temperatures didn't last very long. So it'll last like 24 hours and then I'd be okay. Um, uh, when I was finally diagnosed in London, uh, he said, you probably had this thing for about six months. So that takes me back to the first, the first symptoms I saw when I was in Morocco. Uh, I went to something there. And um, I had this kind of flu -y thing. Mm. I noticed, um, a strange thing, I noticed a pain in, my, in the bones of my shin, which is not something you, you experience unless you kick something hard. And so eventually I was in Chamonix uh, and I had the shakes, you know, I was really like this one evening. And um, my wife on board said, I think you've got malaria because she's mm -hmm. really, really good at self-diagnosis. Um, so she called her mom, I know I'm going to get into serious trouble when I get home tonight. She called her mom and yeah. her mom said, yeah, it's probably malaria. Go yeah. get some, some medication. <laughs> um, but anyway, and, you know, I finally went to a doctor back here in Nairobi who, um, who said, I think you're vitamin D deficient. Here are some supplements. And I said, Look, okay, um, let me go see a proper doctor. <laughs> so I went to, um, to Dr. Silverstein at uh, mm. Nairobi. And he ran a series of tests. He said, because I don't know. So he did about 30, I remember the number now, 30 different blood tests. I know that because it cost me $1,000 uh, just for the test. And I had to pay there. You know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. You're right. And he said, look, I, um, I don't know what the problem is, but I need some more tests. So I need to admit you as soon as I can. It's actually the first time I'd ever been admitted in hospital. And so I went in on the Monday and... Uh, he said, I need to do a bone marrow aspirate. I didn't know what that was. I said, sure. I said, it sounds painful. He said, that'd be fine. And so they actually take some bone marrow out and they test it. And he said, okay, so I think um, you have a problem with your blood. Um, I'm not the expert on the subject, um, so I want to refer you to an expert, but I need to get you out of here pretty soon. And I said, well, sure. I mean, you know, I've got the uh, the elections are coming up, and mm -hmm. you know that was a, mm -hmm. a fairly noisy time. And then I've got the year end coming up, the week after that. So I'll go soon after that. He says, "No, I think, I mean, I'd like you to go like tonight, if I can." So then you start to think, well, maybe this is a little bit serious. Mm. So I went to London, and um, the diagnosis was a thing called acute myeloid leukemia, which is a, a rare form of blood cancer, uh, but curable. So I, I met a fantastic. Um, hematologist there, uh, Donald. And so Donald talked me through it and he says, look, you know, I think the, the thing with this disease is that it's a little bit late onset and usually people are not fit enough to go through the regime that I'm going to put you through. He says, I think you're fine. You know, your heart is fine. Your lung is fine. Your kidneys are fine. Your liver is fine. So I think we'll, we'll put you through this, but it's going to be, um, it's going to be a little harsh. I said, so how long is it going to take? Mm. He says, mm, realistically, he says, six to nine months. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was the biggest shock. So being diagnosed with, with cancer, for me, actually, wasn't such a big deal. Um, a lot of people seem to think that that's a bit strange. But for me, it was, you know, you, you got cancer, you got cancer. You know, you can't undo it. He says, it's a curative program, but it'll be six to nine months. Um, and I thought, um, this is going to be tough. Uh, so he says, we want to start the chemotherapy as soon as we can. 
uh, which is in the next couple of days or so. Mm. So then you had to tell people. You know, I came back and I told the team. Well, I came back, I, I called the team and told them, and then we start to put stuff in place. Uh, the interesting thing was when I said to my wife that I'm going to London, she says, well, okay, when are we leaving? I said, you're coming. She said, well, of course I'm coming. I said, right, so when should we book your return flight? She says, the same time as you. <laughs> I said, well, we don't know how long it's going to take. And I, I honestly, I thought it was going to take at that time yeah. maybe eight weeks or so. Uh, so she says, no, I'm coming. I said, what about everything here? She says, no, we'll fix that. Um, and when we were told it was six to nine months, you know, being a, Saf a Safaricom person, you know, we would then think, yeah, but we can probably do it in five. <laughs> <laughs> In half that time, uh, yeah. So it actually turned out to be nine months and two weeks. So acute myeloid leukemia, leukemia yeah. which means what? Bone marrow trans. So what it means uh, is that the um, <laughs> bit of an expert on the subject now. Yeah. It means that uh, you know your 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 cells in the blood they start out as uh, stem cells, and then they grow and they, they become what they call blast cells, and from there they either turn into red cells or white cells. And what was happening is that they weren't moving from being blast cells. They were just staying like that. So my white cells weren't being produced. And if your white cells are not being produced, then you can't fight infections. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I was getting this, this kind of oh. shakes in temperature. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is you have to get rid of the, the blast cells, which are the cancerous cells. So they put you through two cycles of, of chemotherapy. And um, they, it's like three chemotherapy a day for 10 days, uh, which is a, a bit harsh, but it's not as bad as people who are doing it like every few days. And you and I will remember the young lady, um, Rose. Yes, who Nesimi, you. Rose Nesimi, who yeah. was doing it like every few days. And yeah. you know, you go through this huge dip. Yeah. Whereas I didn't have a chance to go through the huge dip. You know, um, three times a day, the chemotherapy is in there. Yeah. And you just have to kind of brace yourself. And after the second, uh, the second cycle, um, it was fine. You know, I was in complete remission, which took me to about January, February, I think. And then I said, good, now we go home, right? He said, well, you, you can go home, but if you go home, I will guarantee you that in six months' time, which happens to be right about now, he says the cancer will be back and it will be worse than it was when you came. And then I don't think that I can put you through a curative program. I think that we're just going to have to maintain you on chemotherapy until, yeah. <laughs> you know, until you die. Uh, I, yeah. Um, okay. Let's take me back a little bit because you, you know, you, you, you're taking it very lightly here that you, know, you went through the chemo and all that stuff. But it must have been scary for you at some point. You must have thought, I, I, could, I could be dying here. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you do think. I mean, there is a point when you think, okay, so I might not come back. Uh, and then um, <laughs> you, look at, um, you look at the options because, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people who believe that when I die, actually I want to be cremated and pretty quickly. So that long drawn out process. And uh, figured out that the average cost of a funeral in Britain is about $3,000, which is probably about four and a half, but whatever, in, in shillings. Yeah. Um, so I kind of figured that out and decided that uh, I really must get my affairs in order. Now, a colleague of mine, just before I was diagnosed, uh, Barak, Barak came to see me and he was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And, um, you know, being a CEO, I kind of give advice. And I said, okay, Barak, so I don't actually know anyone who's died of lymphoma, <laughs> which is true because Rose had lymphoma. And she, and she, she was fine. My yep. sister had lymphatic cancer and she was fine. So I said to Barak, you'll be good, but make sure that you put your affairs in order, knowing damn well that I didn't have my own affairs in order. So that was something which I had to do fairly quickly. But for sure, I mean, at some point, yeah. because it's a, it's a terrible word. And everybody who's told that they've got cancer responds in a very different way. And, you know, my hematologist said to me, you know, how did you feel when you were first told? Yeah. I said, well, Panis, you know, I, psychologically, I'm probably a little bit deformed because I was, I was okay. You know, you've got leukemia, you've got leukemia. I said, what really upset me was when you guys told me Two things. You, the first one is you said it's going to take nine months, and I thought, are you crazy? You know, there's a company to be <laughs> to, to be, be managed back home, <laughs> yeah. and there's a family and stuff. Yeah. So that was the first thing which really upset me. Mm. And the second thing is when you told me that I'm, you know, I post transplant, I would have uh, an extremely high chance of a relapse. Yeah. I said I've kind of come to terms with that now, and you know, the science is, is really working pretty well. Uh, but being diagnosed with leukemia wasn't. I wasn't upset about it. I kind of 
somehow I kind of expected it. Hmm. Is it hereditary in your family? Or do, I mean, you, you're 60, right? Why do you have to tell everybody I'm 60? <coughs> so I look so 45. Yeah, okay, you're 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 60. So, yeah, it's, so, and it appears now late in life, Bob. I mean, is it in your family? Do you it have usually a, occurs a little bit later. Yeah. This AML occurs usually at about 65. So I, I contract it a little bit early. It's not a hereditary thing. Um, Nobody is quite sure why it happens. Yeah. Had you not been diagnosed early, mm -hmm. could this have killed you? Yeah. It would have killed me, not could. It would have killed me. Because AML becomes fatal within weeks or months. And you can see over the six months since April last year, which incidentally was when, you know, Hugh Masekela, I was with Hugh yes. in, uh, again in Marrakesh. And uh, that was when he was re-diagnosed. Mm -hmm. It was the last time I saw him. Um, so it would have killed me by Christmas for sure. I'd have been, I'd have been, um, I'd have been ex CEO, the late CEO. <laughs> God, and he's laughing. <laughs> okay, S if you hadn't been CEO of Safaricom, mm -hmm. would you have gotten the kind of medical care that you did? You know, flying out, yeah. getting that care. I'm sure it cost a hell of a lot of money. If you hadn't been Bob Collymo CEO of Safaricom, if I hadn't been a Safaricom or a Vodafone employee it would have been difficult for sure. And one of the things that I reflected on a lot when I was um, in isolation, because you know I spent a lot of time on my own, um, was what happens to the, the, the poor Kenyan who's, who's suffering from this? Number one, they're not gonna be diagnosed. No. You know, because you'll just think it's a bit of a fever. Um, and this is always a problem. Uh, people don't go to get diagnosed for whatever. One, because they don't have the money to, for that initial uh, assessment. Um, so th there are many people who, are, who, who will be dying here in, in Kenya mm -hmm. and around the world because of the lack of diagnosis and then because of the lack of care. In, in Britain, you know, if you look at the National Health Service, I know there's a lot of noise that's made about it, but actually my consultant said to me, he says, if you were living in Britain, I would actually just put you on the National Health Service because you'll get better care than the private care that you're getting now. He says, it costs a lot of money. But if you're, so coming back to your question, if, if I wasn't the CEO of Safaricom, if I was a, just the, you know, someone who worked in the call center, uh, would, I have, would I have had the care? The answer is yes, because actually today, I have six of my colleagues who are undergoing cancer treatment. At Safaricom? At Safaricom, yeah. Uh, the colleagues or spouses, because you know, we cover spouses yeah. as well. Two of them are the spouses of the, of the colleague. Um, and out of that, I think three are currently undergoing a stem cell transplant. We can't do it here in Britain, in, um, in Kenya, so they're having it done in, in India. And like me, I mean, the difference with me is mine is high profile. Um, but like me, uh, the company covers it. Sure. And even when the insurance expires, we take it in a case by case, obviously. Yeah. So we cover the cost, the medical cost, we cover the cost of the spouse being there, which is a, which is a huge thing. I mean, if you take my own case, um, you know, I, I'm fortunate, and you know my wife, um, a fantastic lady who, who stuck with me. She went to London, w stayed through that miserable winter that we had, yeah. um, and she, you know, she was there every day. Uh, and, and you know, there's a cost attached to that. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky because my mother and my sister are there as well, of course. But um, so you know, when we made a big sacrifice, and spouses usually do make a big sacrifice, and uh, you know, we we can't underestimate or understate how important that is for the for the patient. Yeah. So you know, our our uh, colleagues they get the same treatment. It's just mine is a bit more high profile. And it's interesting. You know, I, I, there's something I really want to say here is that I, I really want to say how much, how grateful I am to the Kenyan media, print, TV, radio, for respecting my privacy on this. Mm. And uh, you know, uh, when you asked me to come on the show, I was more than happy to because you know, we're very transparent. But you know, nobody probed. So right. the media just respected, they said, you know, he's gone, we don't know what the matter is, but that's his affair. Yeah. Uh, and whatever criticism we can level against the media from time to time, uh, this is one where you know, you've shown uh, a lot of restraint um, yeah. and respect for me and you know there's some other colleagues and you know, we've got some other corporate leaders yeah. who are going through a tough yes, time correct and Friends uh, of ours. you've 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 really shown respect so i want yeah. to say thanks but thanks for that you should have read the blogs good thing you didn't <coughs> moving along 
You know, there's, a, there's an interesting book. <laughs> uh, there's an interesting book published by, uh, by a friend of mine, um, Vishal Agarwal. He published it recently um, called Give to Get. And he opens with an interesting quote, which uh, uh, kind of stuck with me. And mm -hmm. it says, you know, a lion never loses sleep over what a goat might be dreaming about. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, when you think about the blogs, you need yeah. to think about it in that context. Nice, nice. A moment ago, you talked about being in isolation. <laughs> oh, I mean, do you, are you talking isolation in a room? Nobody could come in, or you could leave the room. I mean, w in a bubble. What was it? I wasn't kind of bubble, but it was um, it was a, a negative um, a negative pressure room. So there was double doors, and you know, one door had to shut before the other opened. People could come, obviously. I mean, you know, my wife was coming to see me every day or twice a day, um, but they had to barrier up so you know gloves and um, apron and stuff like that uh, I was stuck in the room for seven weeks um, in that room yeah couldn't get out couldn't get out no but it was okay um, you must have been climbing walls no I was reading a lot and I was thinking and there's nothing wrong with sitting and just thinking um, and then I was working so once I kind of got strong enough yeah uh, I was being a nuisance to the team back here so <laughs> FaceTime yeah. phones emails yeah um, do, you read, do you read anything good? I read lots of good stuff. Uh, yeah, lots of good stuff. I mean, there was an interesting book I read, uh, which was on Bill Gates's recommendation for summer reading, called uh, "Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I've Loved," <laughs> and it's by a woman called uh, Kate uh, Kate Bowley, who was diagnosed with cancer. And you know, a lot of people will say, "Oh, well, you know, everything happens for a reason," and she says, "Yeah, wh what's that reason? What reason is it that I have cancer?" Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing they say is, well, at least, she says, well, at least what? At least it's not stage five cancer. You know, please don't minimize it and don't try and compare it to your own experience. Yeah. So that was a, that was a great book. I, I mean, I fantastic books. Yeah. Is it all gone now? Is the cancer completely gone? So the cancer, I'm in complete remission today. Um, but like most cancer patients, you know, we spend the next five years uh, being under the very watchful eye. And right now it's a very close eye. I mean, I, I met with my doctor here today. So, um, you know, she and I will meet once a week, once a fortnight. Um, I'll do regular blood tests. Uh, so for the first year, we'll watch how this thing goes. Mm -hmm. um, there are some lifestyle changes, which is a little uncomfortable for me, but, you know, I can live with it. So social gatherings, I have to stay away from. And, you know, lots of people say, you know, I've got some people over to my home. Can I, can you want to come? Social gatherings, parties, uh, buffets, all those things I have to stay. Because essentially, my immune system is at zero at the moment. So all of the immunity that I would have built up over the last 60 years yeah. has gone, and that has to be rebuilt again. So I become, sus you know, I become susceptible to mumps, uh, measles, yeah. chicken, rubella, pox. chicken pox, all those things. So I have to stay away from young children, particularly, especially the children whose age you yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. absolutely adore them. But, um, you know, for a while. And, and, and those events you'd loved to attend and, and yeah. partake in, you can't? Particularly with kids, yeah. Yeah. Good Lord. So, I mean, you know, uh, and people, people, people need to understand that I'm not actually being offensive. I mean, we've had two invitations this yes. weekend. And you can't social go. Guys, and I can't, oh, I can't go. Because you don't know who's got a little infection yeah. that they don't even know that they've got it. And if I get it, you know, even if I catch a cold, yeah. because everybody kept saying to me, you know, Nairobi's very cold, Bob. You know, you, you don't, you don't want to come back now. And my doctor said, look, you know, you might want to think about that. Because if people got colds and flus and you get it, you'll, It'll stick around for like two weeks. That's two months. So you have a flu for two months. So try and stay away from those things. And how long will it take to build your immunity? The rest of your life? Basically I think about a year. Oh, okay. About a year before. Even I, I can't even go to Mombasa. I double check with, uh, with my doctor today. And she says that I would really I try and avoid it. I, at least for the next six to eight mm. months. Mm. Um, because of the malarial risk in, yeah. in Mombasa. You talk about buffets a moment ago. What's wrong with buffets? Probably the buffets is that the food was cooked. And then it, there's the risk of it cooling and, and warming again, and then bacteria and uh, fungus can grow. I mean, especially rice. Rice is a difficult thing. So there's a bit of a regime in my home at the moment. When the food is ready, you have to eat straight away. <laughs> don't allow it to cool and come back up again. No. And buffets, you don't know how long it's been yeah, sitting yeah, around absolutely, there. So absolutely. Um, my boss, Washiro Waroda, was asking earlier on, he says, Bob is a fitness fanatic. You know, you wake up, you jog, you walk, you work out, you whatever. So he was asking... Did that help? Well, I, I'm going to take issue with, uh, with Coach and being called, called me a, a fanatic. But it, it helped enormously. Um, and when I left London 
I said to Panos, my consultant, said, look, so, you know, can I go back into the gym? Because we have, incidentally, I, I discovered a trick. I discovered the waistcoat trick. And uh, viewers, if you wondered what the waistcoat trick is, it deals with that middle <laughs> spread. So if you wonder why he's been wearing waistcoats a lot recently, <laughs> it's the spread. And, and so <laughs> we can manage that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no. This is because I said you were 60. Now you're just revealing everything. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, but um, seriously, and he said, look, you know, whatever you were doing before, get back into it. So, you know, since I've been back, uh, I've been getting up at quarter past five, getting down to the gym, and, and working my way back up mm. to it because you can't do those. Mm. So I'm not a fitness fanatic, but, you know, I used to go to my gym. I have a gym at home. I used to go to the gym five or six times yeah. a week. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I felt good for it, and I'm feeling good for it now again. And incidentally, this is not there anymore. This is gone. It's just that I, I, I bought the waistcoat, so <laughs> I'm going to wear them now. <laughs> you look great, man. I can't, I can't believe this. But you know what? While you were away, <clears throat> other than the handshake, but while you were away, <laughs> there must have been at least 10,000 Kenyans who died of cancer. This mm. disease is just, it's, it's decimating families here, huh? And, and, and you know, it was always, I'm sure it was always there, but all of a sudden, I don't know if it's lifestyle, diet, uh, whatever it is, but... But so look, I'm, I'm not a doctor, not a cancer specialist, um, but for sure, more people appear to be dying of cancer yeah. now. And the odd thing is that they don't need to die of cancer. You know, I, I spent time in two different cancer units, um, one at, uh, at Guy's and the other at Harley Street um, in, um, uh, in, in Houston. And, uh, you know, they, the cancer for, for the people who are working there, it's like a cold. I mean, they're like, okay, we'll fix you up and you'll, you'll go. And, and the reason why we didn't talk about cancer here is because people over-respond to the word. Um, and, you know, if, if, Lord forbid, if I said, you know, you're diagnosed with cancer, immediately you're going to have a problem with yeah. that. But you don't have to have a problem with it because it's cured. You know, in my family, my, my ex-wife had cancer. Um, my sister had cancer. And both of them... Well, you know, Claire, my ex-wife, mm. um, she celebrated her fifth year cancer-free when I was in London. My sister celebrated her sixth year cancer-free. So you don't have to die of cancer. Yeah. Now, there's a problem with healthcare because healthcare can never be free. If you just take how long a doctor takes to train, so that can never be free. But we also have a problem with insurance because people can't afford insurance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for the country to provide free healthcare is a challenge. So, you know, people need to find solutions. And don't wait for emergency funding because, you know, if, you, if I'd waited for emergency funding, honestly, Jeff, uh, you know, even rich friends like you, it would not have been, it wouldn't have happened. You'd be dead. You'd be dead. Especially if I relied on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's two down, two to go. Okay. Yeah, he's still, apparently he's still looking at the screen, and the screen is as empty as mine. I don't know why you're pretending. Are you, sh are you shy? It's my you? notes. It's my notes. There's no notes there. I can't see any notes. No notes. So you decide to come back home. You're flying eight hours from Heathrow. Mm -hmm. Are you excited? Are you scared? Are you, what's going through your mind? So uh, we were going through one of the best summers that London has had for yeah, it was a very, very long, long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably a result of climate change, but, um, you know, we were having 30 <coughs> degrees, 32 degrees. Fantastic. You know, London is great. Of course, you know, I can't really go to enjoy. I mean, Paul Simon did his farewell concert in Hyde Park. Crowds. I couldn't go. Crowds. I couldn't go. You know, I can only go into restaurants like at three o'clock in the afternoon the minute it empties out. But nonetheless, London was great. But I was just so desperate to get back to Nairobi. Mm. Um, and I don't know how, can I, how I explain it, but I was finding it difficult to sleep in the last week. Yeah. Um, although people were saying to me, you know, you might want to stay another couple of weeks. People in Nairobi were saying, oh, it's so cold. You want to stay another couple of it weeks? It was pretty cold. Um, I said, no, I, I'm fine. I have got sweaters. And so I was excited to get back. And uh, again, you know, I talked a bit about being grateful to the media and, and really admire them, how they've handled this. Uh, but people, you know, I learned a lot about people. I learned a Go lot on. about... Kenyans. I, I was getting goodwill messages from people who I didn't know, from customers. I mean, obviously, members of staff were fantastic. Mm. And it was almost like they were in a roster for sending me messages. Every day, I'd get like 10 messages from people. But I was getting messages from archbishops. I was getting messages from imams and sheikhs, um, from, from politicians, 
um, f from the, even the people who were trying to resist me um, were, were in touch, yeah. you know, because yeah. politics is one thing. My competitors, you know, uh, Aldo and, uh, and Petey. Yeah. Aldo was the f one of the first people to send me a message when he heard I was, I was gone. And again, he sent me a message yesterday to say, you know, welcome back mm. and so we can get in for the fight. But mm. um, so Ordinary Kenyans showed such, um, you know, uh, such care. Uh, as the people who I've never met and will probably never meet, uh, and you you can't imagine how much it helps them. Huh? Yeah, it might doesn't might not seem like a lot when you send that message, but uh, I said to my wife, it's a bit like the snowflake. You know, one snowflake is not a lot, but those snowflakes can turn into an avalanche. And when you say emotionally, what keeps you afloat, yeah. what keeps you kind of punching through this, is um, is the people behind you. Uh, you know, Caroline, uh, Caroline Matoka, for example, she used to send me regular messages and say, the, the prayer brigade um, has been praying for you again, and the prayer brigade was her mother and her daughter. <laughs> uh, and when I think about this phrase, the prayer brigade, yeah. I thought, I can't let them down. Because when I look back, yeah. there were so many people there. And then you walk the into Safaricom house. How the heck can I afford to die and let and let all these people down, I can't. I mean, mm. so let's just go. Let's just go do it. Mm. So uh, you know, a, a real heartfelt uh, and emotional word of, of thanks to to everybody who sent messages. I mean, it came from all over the world, but particularly from Kenya. And I really felt that I was part of something important here. Yeah, in the messages are still coming in. Believe me, um, Manu Chandaria. Oh, Manu sent me a, Manu was lovely. Manu sent me a, a Manu, if you, if you are watching. He is watching. Uh, we are going to come for tea. It's actually <laughs> in my, in my to-do list. I can show you. Yeah. Um, because Manu uh, and your wife, you know, you've been fantastic. And the words of support from, from Manu. I mean, you know, you take someone like, like Gideon from Corp Bank. And Gideon would send me messages most Sundays. Um, he'd send me long passages from Psalms. Uh, and th those are the messages which kind of kept you going, as well as the, the drugs, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gideon, the guy who, who just made three hundred and seventy million. Is it? You know, that's <laughs> I don't know what you want to come out of that, but uh, there's an interesting thing about this salary. I, I think the transparency is good. As you know, oh, uh, Joshua and I went there. <laughs> uh, don't pick on Joshua's salary, so. <laughs> but you know, we, we we were for this transparent thing. But when you look at the number, the number can be a little bit misleading because. Um, you know, it's, it's a big salary, so let's not get around that. Um, but you know, it also includes things like deferred bonuses, right? Mm. Yeah. And deferred bonuses are often given in shares, and the shares might wor be worth nothing. You might not even get it if you don't hit certain criteria. So um, when people do the, I saw on the way here, someone was working out how much I'm, I'm earning <laughs> per second. A second, um, yes. Of course, you never get a check for 196 million shillings. I mean, um, you get your salary, and then you get a a bonus based on your performance, and then you get this thing which might or might not happen. But all of that is thrown into this mix that, uh, you know, Gideon and me and Joshua <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and the other guys gets, my yeah. God. But we'll get over it. I think, you know, I think what's important about this, um, about this transparency is that, first of all, <coughs> it's transparent. And now we know, shareholders know how much they're paying their CEOs. Are you listening to me or are you reading that? I, I'm reading something from Maina Kageni. Yeah, tell Miner that. D tell Miner if he's watching this. Yes, he is. Thanks for not visiting me in London in December. Miner says I'm going to come and visit you, bro. You know what Miner is like. Yeah, I know. What I'm going to come like. visit you. Yeah, he never turned up. Yeah, we were supposed to have a meeting yesterday. So he didn't show up. Yeah, Miner, you he see. He says I'm going to call you tomorrow morning. He was going to call me yesterday morning. <laughs> you know, I, I I skipped the gym. You know, so <laughs> Look at what Miner, he said. when you call, yeah. when you call, I'm not answering. <laughs> So don't bother. <laughs> it says, Ebu tell that ninja, <laughs> welcome back. That's mine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good man, great manager, genius, worthy of reward. Yeah, it's a bit too much. It's a bit too much. <laughs> a bit over the uh, top. But the good man, I, I'm, I'm grateful just for the <laughs> good man. The good man is nice. <laughs> Jack Odongo, you know Jack? Mm -hmm. Jack says, I respect Bob's candor and fitness and Safaricom initiatives for so much of Kenya's social fabric. Ceylon, sir, Ceylon, we need you. Thanks, I mean, I really urge people, get yourself fit. Yeah. Don't ignore it. I mean, I, you know, I was just, I, I didn't even know I was keeping fit. I mean, I was keeping fit for vanity reasons more than anything else. Uh, but it, it, it really helps, it helped. really helps. Keep yourself fit. You don't have to go to the gym. I mean, walk. I was in London, I couldn't go to the gym, yeah. but I walked, you know, kilometers every day, even when I was really 
in the middle of the treatment. When you were in that so bubble, were you walking around the room? Or so the bubble, <laughs> the bubble. We we had some um, some makeshift things. So we had a uh, you know some resistance stuff. Uh. Uh, but certainly when I walked out, they said to me, "Be careful, um, because th you don't think you can walk as far as you can." Uh, and just walking like five minutes, <laughs> you know, oh. because the muscle wastage yes. comes very quickly. Uh, it comes back, providing you don't. But, you know, there was never a day where I sat in pajamas all day. Never. Right. Uh, every morning I'd wake up, I'd shower, I'd get dressed. And, um, you know, uh, the, when I was not in hospital, every day I'd go out and walk, even when it's like minus 10 degrees. Yeah. We're going to take a break, come back. Before we do that, real quick, someone watching you right now has cancer has been diagnosed with cancer, whatever stage it is, what would you tell them? I mean, you're a cancer survivor now. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them? Because people, like you say, first thing, you lose hope very fast, and then you see yourself deteriorating very fast. What do you tell them? Um, I don't know that I can give people advice. Uh, I would say trust in the science, because the science really does work. Uh, we have... Uh, you know the doctor that I'm that's taking care of me here. Uh, you know she trained in London. She is, I, I put my life in her hands. So we had some pretty good professionals. Yeah. Um, once you're sure of the diagnosis, get a second opinion, right? But once you're sure of the diagnosis, cancer is not. It really is not a death sentence. Um, you know I, of course, some people die. Unfortunately, one of my colleagues, um, their spouse, has just passed away, yeah. sadly. Um, on on the way back from uh, from rehab, hmm. um, but of course people people do die, but it is not a death sentence. I mean, you know, look at me, I'm I'm fine. Yeah, you are indeed. Bob Collymore there. We're gonna take a break. Come back. Switch gears. Okay, you talked about your salary. But okay, we'll talk about Safaricom. What's the deal, man? The dominant player. They they summoned you to Parliament to explain why you're the dominant player. I mean, what's that about? <laughs> and the future. How much how much longer on your contract? A year. Did you hear about the handshake while you were there? I've spoken to both handshake participants. Well, excuse me. Bob Colimo speaks to everybody. Which handshake are we talking about? <laughs> I told my, my, my next door neighbor. They had a big fight. Uh, you know, they're now they're, they're too together late, again. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Keep tweeting at Kwenanga Jeff at Bob Colimo. Uh, at Citizen TV Kenya, the hashtag is JK Live. What a story this man has. I tell you, he's got, he's like the Energizer Bunny. And he's got a new lease on life. And it's great to see. Lots of lessons to be learned. First of all, fitness. I'm getting back to the gym. Yeah, we'll notice when you get rid of that waistcoat. Okay. Jeff Kunanga Live takes a break. We'll be back in a, <laughs> <laughs> back in a moment. <laughs>